macroeconomics. We're talking about public goods and common resources. A couple of definitions to start us off. Okay, we just we're talking about rivalry. That means one person's use means that there's less for other people to use. And another definition is excludability. That means is it a free item, like the dog park? Anybody, there's open admission and everybody can come in and, and um, use it, or do you have to pay for it? Now, both public goods and common resources are non-excludable. That means we can't prevent someone from using it. And we have to be careful, there can be positive and negative externalities associated with, with each one of these things. Okay, let's just go back to um, our notes that we had up on the document camera. A street light or national defense. You can even think of a fireworks show. These are all examples of public goods. So the dog park, Cameron Park, you can think of these as common resources. July 4th, HUB always sponsors our, our fireworks show, right? Anybody can go watch. Even though HMB is paid for it, you can't exclude people who haven't <coughs> sponsored the show. Or you, it's impossible, right? All the fireworks can be up in the air. Anybody can look at it and benefit from it. Now, with these open admission places, the same kind of thing. Both of these products, types of products, are what we call not excludable. That means you can't prevent people who haven't paid for them to um, benefit from it. So the common resources and public goods are non-excludable? Are both non-excludable, yes. And when we have non-excludability, we have a possible problem of, you know, somebody taking advantage of it, or the free rider problem. Okay, with public goods, it is non-excludable. But unlike common goods, it has um, non-rivalry. We said, you know, parks can get used up. It can get really crowded. So it has that element of rivalry or getting used up. But public goods have um, the characteristics of non-excludability. That means anybody can come and benefit. And think of the street life. So one person's use doesn't diminish someone else's um, benefit or use <coughs> from it. All right, so public goods. Think of things like our fireworks show or national defense or street lights. Um, I-35, lots of street lights out there, right? We're driving to Dallas or Austin. How many, you know, helps us see where we're going. How many of y'all would donate money to pay for those street lights along I-35? I don't see anybody jumping up and down. I don't see any hands going up. Okay, why? Because I got headlights. <laughs> so you've got headlights on your own car? It's paid by taxes. What we pay, we be willing to pay taxes on it? Yeah. Um, well, it's not your property. It's not your property, right? Right. I mean, how much control will I have over the light if it was mine, if I could donate to it? Are you going to give up? your control over the light so I can have more control because of my, my cost or Well, my we're just going to assume that it's, you know, you, you're not going to have control over it. It's just, right. Someone else is going to operate. But 
you know, we're, we're going to pay for lights on our own property, but if it's a common property, something that's open to everybody, you all can see that if we didn't have the government providing lights along you know, I-35, it's not going to happen if you just left it up to the private market. And so we all like it. We all benefit from it. We all want to, to see where we're going on I-35, but we're going to have this free rider problem that everybody's going to want it, but nobody's going to want to pay for it. And so that's why we would, you know, you could argue that we need the government to, um, to help us out with that. Because if we do have street lights that everybody can see, then we've got positive externalities for everybody who, who can see. Okay, some other examples of public goods. I'm going to skip over to this slide. You know, if we're saying that the government should provide things like street lights or maybe even lighthouses, um, we have to do this cost-benefit analysis, right? Um, if we say that a street light, a traffic light, needs to be installed, then the government should be in charge of that. You know, we've got to, that's going to come from tax money, and is it going to be worth it for the government to install that there? And so, the case study that your author mentions here, you know, this is terrible for somebody to, you know, lose their life at a, a traffic accident, but if you were to look at the, you know, have to estimate the cost of someone's life and the benefit of, you know, having that light there versus the cost of installing it, then, you know, that's one way that we could do a cost-benefit analysis. Okay, let's take a look at common resources. Common resources have the two characteristics of being not excludable. That means you can't keep out people who haven't paid, but it does get used up. So think of the Waco Dog Park or the Cameron Park. Nobody is charging you to get in. It's not excludable. Even though you're a little kid, you haven't paid any taxes, so technically you have not contributed to the tax money that's gone to the renovation of um, an upkeep of Cameron Park. But it's also rival. That means if we have a lot of people there, it gets crowded and you can't enjoy the park as much. We've talked about the tragedy of the commons before, but the story just shows that um, if people overuse or litter or pollute a, a common area or common resource, and there's kind of this tendency to do that. If it's not my property, I'm just going to you know, leave my trash here. Versus if this is my own private property and this, own, this is my yard, I have an incentive to maintain that. Um, this is a argument, again, for the government to maintain parks and to provide and, and clean up because there is a tendency for it to get overused. And when it does get overused, then that'll be you know, a, a negative externality for all of us if we can't enjoy Cameron Park. And again, going back to what we've talked about with negative externalities before, the government can address the problem through regulating, so making rules, you can't dump your trash here, or um, maybe have a penalty in terms of a tax, or they can turn that common resource into a private good. So now they could possibly turn it into an excludable good by saying you have to pay to get in. Cameron Park. Some other common resources, some other examples of common resources, okay, not excludable, that means you can't keep away people who haven't paid, but rival, it gets used up. So you can think of our highways and our roads, our air and water. And just thinking about this in terms of excludability and rivalry, um, that explains, in this case study, why the cow is not extinct. And they're you know, comparing different animals here. Um, for example, elephants, they just kind of roam 
buffaloes are just roaming wild and they don't have an owner, right? They're, they're not private property of anyone's. And so you can think of them as a common resource. And what did we learn from the story of the tragedy of the commons? Common resources tend to get overused. And so if nobody's owning these elephants and everybody wants their tusks for the ivory and they can turn that into uh, jewelry and other things they get money for, there's a strong incentive to you know, over, over poach and, and kill them. That's why they're, you know, there's so few of them. But for cows, that's a private good. People ran their cattle and that's part of your herd and they they have an incentive to maintain their their population on your own ranch. And so that's why the, the cow isn't extinct or facing, you know, isn't an endangered species. So we've needed the government to help the elephant population in several of these countries that we have up here. What they've done is actually turn elephants into a private good in some of these countries. So you are allowed to kill elephants if they're on your property only, not on someone else's property. And that has actually helped the elephant population. Okay, so we've talked about public goods. Remember those who can't keep away people who haven't paid and they don't get used up. So an example of a public good is a street light or a fireworks show. Common resources, think of a dog park or a camera park that gets used up if it gets too crowded, but you can't keep away non payers or our highways. Well, let's take a look at those first two. We've got private goods and natural monopolies. So let me come back over here to our document camera. Okay, someone said food. That's the easiest one to think of. Something that gets used up when you consume it. Hey, does Papa John's give you your pizza before you have paid for it? No. So this is rival and excludable. Right? And we call this a private good. Companies like things that they can exclude not pay no pairs for, right? They'll sell it to you in the unit since you have to pay every single time. That's why we can leave it up to the market to produce these kinds of products, private goods, rather than public goods. So think of the way that we define it. Um, cable TV. I remember at my... Okay, first of all, do you have to pay for it? Yes. Yes, so it's excludable. And it doesn't get used up, so this is called a natural monopoly. I think of the apartment that I used to work in, or used to live in. They were installing cable um, for for Time Warner, and the guys were digging ditches so far into the ground you could just barely see their heads. They were digging such deep d ditches there, and it makes sense for one company to be digging those ditches, right, and setting up connections to all the apartment units for that apartment. Because if we had a whole bunch of different companies digging ditches and setting up all those connections, there'd be, you know, lots of, lots of ditches everywhere. So it makes sense in this case with cable TV or Waco water to have one sewer system for the city and it just makes sense not, I know we like competition, we like to have different, um, companies to choose from, but in some instances where the product is excludable and non-rival, we call it a natural monopoly because it makes sense to have one supplier to a particular part of complex. Right. You don't want a whole bunch of pipes you know, connected to your house. You just want one set and that makes it easier. So, just remember what the definitions of rivalry and excludability are, and that there are different types of goods for, for each instance. Okay. And 
this slide is just a summary slide that shows you those four types of products. And that is the end of chapter 11.